You are listening to Wrestling Observer Live with your hosts, Brian Alvarez and Mike Sempervivi. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it on. Let's get it. Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts. I'm required to say that even though we're not going to be talking about any mixed martial arts on this program. But professional wrestling is something we talk about every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcast Network. And however you're joining me today, tune in iHeart, American Forces Radio, over-the-air affiliates like the Mightier 1090, SportsByline.com, Sirius XM 156, via podcast or video streaming on Twitch and YouTube. Just want to say thank you for spending a little bit of time with me today. I'm tired. I broke the Nationals jersey out because they've taken two or three from the Dodgers. Got the Red Bull ready to go right now. ASMR kids, get ready. There it is for you. Well, nothing happened in the world of Vince McMahon that would put him on the cover of Wall Street Journal or CNN or Variety or To Catch a Predator. None of those things have happened today. No. So Brian Alvarez is traveling right now in peace. We still have, you know, 53 minutes left to go here in this hour, so you never know what could happen. But things are looking relatively calm on the Vince McMahon front, at least for right now. We'll have to wait and see how many other Wall Street Journal stories come out, what exactly is going to take place on real sports and all that sort of stuff. But today, the drama actually goes for the birthday boy, Vince's son-in-law, Triple H. Happy birthday, Paul Levesque. 53 years old. And what did you get for your birthday? A brachial plexus injury to Matt Riddle. I have never heard of a brachial plexus injury, and I've suffered one before. He got a stinger, everybody. That's what they are saying happened to Matt Riddle. Uh, Due to Seth Rollins and whether that is fully legitimate, whether that is partially legitimate... We'll have to find that out. But one thing is for sure, that match is off SummerSlam on Saturday. Who will his opponent be? We can get into a little speculation on that, as well as many other things that are going to be taking place, including WrestleMania coming to Philadelphia. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. Anywhere having sex in the Bugatti, nobody couldn't see us because the windows got foggy. Flames try to rob me. It's gonna be a high me. I hope the president appointed me. Welcome back to Wrestling Observer Live. My name is Mike Sempervivi, and as many of you know already, we do this show for an hour at a time. But if you want us 24-7, you can find us on Twitter. I am at Sempervivi. The timeline for this show is at W-O-N-F-4-W. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. And if you love pro wrestling, at Mid-Atlantic Pod. I'm not sure if at Brian Alvarez has posted any of his adventures today, but... You can hear him again tomorrow on this very show with me. And if you can't wait for that, become a member to WrestlingObserver.com slash Figure4Online.com. That way you could become a member and listen to exclusive audio like Brian and Dave reviewing tonight's AEW Dynamite. And we're going to be getting into that show coming up. But first, I have an ad to read. Did you know Ric Flair was having his last match coming up this Sunday in Nashville? I bet you you did. Ric Flair's last match.com has all of the details. It will be the Nature Boy teaming up with his son-in-law, Andrade El Idolo, to face off against Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. The weekend gets started with the roast of Ric Flair on Friday night. The next day, you're going to have panels with Brian Danielson, Claudio Castagnoli, a Horseman reunion, Bret Hart talking SummerSlam 92, plus meet and greets with people like Paige, McFoley, Kevin Nash, and many, many more. It's all a part of the biggest StarCast yet. StarCast 5, pictures, autographs, convention stuff that you're used to, but also now the addition of pro wrestling including Black Label Pro on Friday, Game Changer Wrestling on Friday, New Japan Pro Wrestling on Saturday, and, of course, Ric Flair's last match taking place on Sunday. It's an 11-match card all going down at the Nashville Municipal Auditorium. Tickets are still on sale for only $39. Just go to RicFlair'sLastMatch.com. And I will use this as a transition. 
okay? Because here's the lineup so far. You know what the main event is. You got Josh Alexander against Jacob Fatu for the Impact title. You got the Impact's Knockouts Championship going on with Jordan Grace defending against Deanna Perrazzo and Rachel Elring in a three-way. You have Ricky and Kerry Morton with Robert Gibson in their corner against Brian Pillman Jr. and Brock Anderson with Arn Anderson in their corner. Ray Phoenix against Laredo Kid against Taurus against Bandito in a four-way. The American Wolves, Davey Richards and Eddie Edwards against the Motor City Machine Guns. Killer Cross against Davey Boy Smith Jr. Ren Narita against Yuya Uemura, who's filling in for Clark Connors as he has got a herniated disc. He announced that this past Sunday. The Von Erics against the Briscoes. Bunkhouse Battle Royal, which Bully Ray, uh, who is it now? Crimson and James Storm is going to be a part of. And... A four-way with Kanosuke Takashita, Alan Angels, Takeshita, sorry. Alan Angels, Jonathan Gresham, and Nick Wayne. And you may remember the story that Brian told you yesterday about Nick Wayne's plane adventures, he and his mother. Uh, and good news, he is back in the States. He is back at home in Seattle. Uh, he let everybody know this yesterday afternoon, said, I made it back to Seattle. I appreciate you all for everything. Wayne and his mother, for those who have not heard this story, were flying from Frankfurt, Germany to Seattle on a flight where a bomb threat was scrawled on the bathroom mirror. So Brian Alvarez reported this Tuesday morning on Wrestling Observer Radio. He told the story yesterday on the show. The airline reported that there were 266 people on the flight and ended up getting diverted to Iceland. Everybody got interrogated, but everything worked out okay. No word on if they actually got the person that scrawled bomb on the bathroom mirror, but at least Nick Wayne won his match on Sunday in London. So <laughs> there was that, just a, a crazy situation for him. It's been a crazy year for him, and that's going to continue on this coming weekend where, I'll tell you what, Kanosuke Takeshita is excellent, and Jonathan Gresham's wrestling game is strong. I don't know if Tony Khan ended up finding that out, or he just got cursed out by Gresham. I was a little late to that one uh, with the fallout from Saturday's ROH pay-per-view. But uh, it, it is a very interesting card. Obviously, the Ric Flair stuff on top is is what they're pushing. But when you look at some of the stuff on the rest of the card, it is very interesting. But that's enough of that for now. We got big, big, big news. Not that that's, of course, not. It's Ric Flair. He's a legend and everything. But... WrestleMania 40 has been announced for April 6th and 7th next year, and it will be taking place from Philadelphia's Lincoln Financial Field, the link, the home of the NFL, Philadelphia Eagles, and the WWE, the Eagles, Philadelphia Mayor Jim Kenney, and the city's tourism board sent out a joint press release this morning announcing everything. It is going to be the second WrestleMania in the city's history, the first since WrestleMania 15th on March 28th, 1999. I believe that was Rock in Austin, and I'd have to go back and look at the rest of the card but I don't remember it being very good. I think that was the one that had the Battle Royal on the pre-show to see who would face Owen Hart and Jeff Jarrett for the tag titles and the big boss man getting hung uh, by The Undertaker in the Hell in a Cell. It was a it was a good main event, from what I recall, if I'm not mixing up shows there. So this is going to be much bigger, that's for sure. How many names they call on from the past, I don't know. Jeff Jarrett... Could stay. You never know with him. He could still be in the mix and actually appear on WrestleMania. In fact, I'm sure he'll appear on WrestleMania. Will he have a match or not? God knows. You know, God only knows. He he never had that match against Effie that everybody was waiting to see. Jeff, Let's see if he gets uh killed with a guitar shot at some point this weekend in Nashville. Eh, we'll see about that, but. That's it for now when it comes to, to WrestleMania. There will be more details obviously coming out. They'll hype everything up. Surely on SmackDown this coming Friday. And surely uh, for Raw on Monday. Put all the ticket packages on sale towards the end of the year. I may. You know, I was this close to going to New Orleans. And unfortunately, my brother, who we had planned everything with, ended up going into the service. Or actually was in the service in the Air Force and got a call that said, no, you're going to England. So all those plans went out the window. I've been semi-bitter since then. And plus, 
I'm old and I, I just don't want to be arsed, frankly, to, at this point to go to a show. But with WrestleMania being very near me in Philadelphia, I may have the excuse to do it. Not sure who else was in the running for this. You know, I know Philadelphia, when it comes to the East Coast, other than Miami, and I guess if you want to consider Atlanta, you know, with the exception of New York, Philadelphia was the only place that was really going to make sense. And they've been the only ones that have been actively pursuing events like that. D.C., Baltimore, Boston, it doesn't seem like they have tried to go after WWE events with the same kind of chutzpah that, that Philadelphia has, especially for WrestleMania. So April 6th and 7th, 2024, that's where that will be. Here's a, oh boy, this was a, and you can read this at WrestlingObserver.com. Citing sources within the creative process, a Fightful report said that assistance on the creative writing team needed to filter the now former WWE CEO and chairman Vincent Kennedy McMahon for, quote, a long time, and that meeting notes were heavily edited due to the aforementioned insensitive language to calling people the wrong names to using terms that really weren't socially acceptable. In another part of the report, a former production employee confirmed the long-running stories about McMahon blowing up on the announcers on headsets due to minor issues. The report also intimated from some that McMahon didn't remember some of the things that he'd done creatively in the past, resulting in them being done over and over. <laughs> so that is a report that came out from Fightful that you can see at WrestlingObserver.com. Uh, McMah McMahon had publicly said that he retired from WWE last Friday while filings with the SEC show that he resigned. You know, to, to Vince, I'm sure it's a six of one, half a dozen of the other. But to those people that are looking at this story, you know, some of that verbiage actually matters. So Triple H in charge, as we mentioned, now with the headache of Seth Rollins being without an opponent coming up here for SummerSlam. We'll get into that, the New Japan G1, and of course, at some point, the vaunted NXT 2.0 review. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. Back on Wrestling Observer Live, Mike Sempervivi here with you. Nationals and the Dodgers just getting started right now. Guy hitting me on Twitter, mentioning Ric Flair's last match again. Please, bro, I'm tired of hearing and seeing about it. They're ad reads, okay? What do you want me to tell you? Do you think the, the NFL Sirius XM radio show hosts have a personal connection to the woman at the Marriott Residence Inn in room 526 that keeps sending notes about her uh, amenities? No. It's an ad they have to read, and that's what I'm doing here, okay? You know, look, it, it'll be over after this weekend, all right? Sunday, in fact. It's not like we're the only ones doing this here. They spent a lot of money on this show, so it's, it's, Rick, Rick, Rick could probably use some of that. So, what's it? And by the way, Jim Crockett, apparently, I guess Jim Crockett uh, promotions the uh, trademark is going to be reverting over to David Crockett right now. It's in the hands, I guess, of a 50-50 split between Conrad Thompson and he. I guess it's going to be all his now. I think that's exactly the same thing that happened with the Four Horsemen trademark that Arn Anderson now owns. When they were able to wrangle that, it ran out from WWE. It was able to get scooped up, and now he's got control of it. So same thing when it goes for David Crockett and Jim Crockett Promotions. I don't know if he'll actually be able to do anything with it, maybe sell some merchandise with the, the old JCP logo on there. Hey, I, I might buy one of those things. I'm kind of partial towards Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, if you didn't know. So eh, we'll see about that. But back to the business at hand here, and that Vince McMahon story that i mentioned look he's a 77 year old man there's nothing about that that surprises me whatsoever and there was nothing that surprised me about freddie prince's podcast today freddie prince jr the actor who was once a member of the wwe writing team busted out a a new edition of his podcast about wrestling that he was Planning on doing a lot more of, apparently, but he has not done one for quite some time. But uh, perfect timing to come out at a time where Vince McMahon steps down and he had some thoughts about the whole deal, had some thoughts about Nick Khan and Stephanie McMahon. Could those two coexist as a, a co-CEO, which, 
Dave has talked about it with, I believe it was Garrett has talked about it with a couple of people, I think, about the fact that co-CEOs usually don't work. So he's got a little bit of insight into that as well as some of his thoughts on working there and dealing with Vince, including him having no hobbies because it's been brought up. Like, what is Vince going to do now? It's not like he's been Mr. Grandfather and he's going to go home and, like, you know, play with the grandkids and the dog and all that sort of stuff. Is he going to do that? Let's hope so. But I have no idea what a guy that's been that driven and in that bubble for so long is going to do. And to show how much of a bubble that he's in, Freddie Prinz was one time on the plane, on the, the jet, when they were flying, and he was watching Richard Pryor's uh, Live on the Sunset Strip, the, the, the great comedy uh, performance of Richard Pryor, and Vince actually leaned over to him to ask, who's that? And it's like, I, you know, just, it, it kind of blows my mind that somebody who was as iconic as Richard Pryor throughout the 70s into the 80s, Vince would be leaning over to ask, who's that? But I guess if you, you never watch any comedy and you never watch any movies, I guess, well, how would you hell you know who Richard Pryor was? But he did have, and this is not surprising either when it comes to Kevin Dunn, he did have some some thoughts on Kevin Dunn and the battles that he would go through trying to pitch things. Now, this was in reference to Vince as well, too, but the clip that I'm going to play here is about 40 seconds long, and his him talking about initially Beth Phoenix, and, and unfortunately, you know, her being around and on her rise at a time where we weren't, we were still stuck in the Divas edition, and we were still stuck in the that realm where if you, you wanted to have any TV time for Beth that wasn't just the occasional one-off match, well, we got to stick her with Santino Morella, and we'll do that sort of thing. But, Dom, go ahead and play the clip right now of Freddie Prinze Jr. talking about WWE executive producer Kevin Dunn. More than anything, and then this other guy who I never got the sense liked wrestling at all. Like he sure. was trying to turn it in more to like the NFL or like Tyson versus Holyfield, which is cool, man. But yeah. it wasn't like wrestling. And so you just see this room of like, I don't know, there were probably 20 writers when I worked there. And it was just 20 writers throwing sand against a tidal wave. Bro, you could pitch for 20 minutes and Kevin would be like, well, I don't think she's pretty. And all of a sudden, like six weeks of story were just gone. And it's like, Yo, B, what? Well, yeah. our champ has to be pretty. It's like, yo, did you think Mankind was pretty? So there you hear Freddie Prinz. That is on his Wrestling with Freddie podcast that you can find anywhere that you find podcasts, including this one right here on, on Apple, iHeart, Spotify, all those sorts of things. He does about uh, 45 minutes or so kind of talking about Everything that, uh, again, with his friend Jeff Dye, and they just kind of talking about some of the situations there. It's a very loose, light thing, but I, I got such a kick out of that, and there were people that were, you know, jumping up and down this morning on Twitter when he had said it, when the thing was released, and it's like, well, are you surprised at all? That is exactly what people have been saying about Kevin Dunn for a long, long time. And, look, it's television. It's entertainment. Aesthetics matter. They absolutely matter. They do. But like Freddie Prince noted, we're not ever talking about mankind's looks. We don't talk about Dusty Rhodes' looks all that much. Yeah, we made fun of the splotch and all that stuff, but we didn't say that, you know, oh, well, he's had Bell's palsy, and he talks with a lisp, and this, that, and the third, and no, I don't I don't think he's would be a good champion. Ric Flair's nose is too big. He couldn't be a good champion. But the women have had to suffer with this for a long time. And they may still have to continue to suffer with this. And when you look at a lot of the people that Johnny Ace has brought in and, and at the time of, of heading up talent relations and his idea on people, you see how, for the most part, Vince has treated women's wrestling for a long, long time at Freddie Prinze on the show. Gives a lot of credit to Stephanie McMahon. I know a lot of people think Stephanie McMahon, because of how she is, gets way overpraised by the mainstream for that and that's that's true she does but 
Freddie Prinze's point of view. She was one of the only ones who would try to get up there and try to fight the fight. But as he notes during the podcast as well, there were some days that it just wasn't worth fighting that fight with Kevin Dunn and, and her father, Vince McMahon. So now that he is gone, we will see how things change. Things have not changed production-wise all that much. As Brian noted yesterday, the 79 billion kazillion camera cuts that take place on Raw and on SmackDown need to stop, like, now, today. Maybe before All Out, when you're going to have an NXT show. Did you hear about this one? Competition never die. Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics reported yesterday that NXT was going to be holding a premium live event. On September 4th, of course, airing on Peacock, or if you're out of the country on the WWE Network. Funny enough, same day that AEW is, of course, running all out in Chicago, greater Chicago, Hoffman Estates, Illinois. WWE has still not confirmed a date yet, but Thurston did report yesterday that the next NXT television special would be called Heat Wave and take place on August 16th. All of that came to pass on last night's show, so don't worry. You'll hear all about that later. So WWE already has one event taking place during Labor Day. It's WWE Clash at the Castle taking place on Saturday, September 3rd in Cardiff. A match between Drew McIntyre and Sheamus on Friday's SmackDown will uh, determine the challenger for who is going to face off against either Roman Reigns or Brock Lesnar at that show. So... I could see them doing, you know, the the day night double header thing since I'm not exactly sure I got to double check what time people on the east coast and on the west coast of the United States will be able to watch Clash at the Castle, but if you have that on at let's say three o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern time, noon Pacific, you go and you have AEW that night, look. Anybody that's going to watch AEW is going to watch AEW. Anybody that's going to watch NXT is probably going to watch NXT, so I don't really have a problem with that whatsoever, you know, with with DVRs and especially with Peacock, with the on-demand searching and functions and all that sort of stuff. I'm not sweating this at all, and I'm not surprised by it at all. In fact, I, I would tend to expect these types of things. It, it can be a little annoying, you know, especially if they do these things on a Sunday. But on Saturday, for somebody like me, I'll never complain about it because it actually makes everything a whole lot easier to try to get gathered up before we come back on the air on Monday. So I'm all for this. I have no problem with it whatsoever. Now, all of this news that has been taking place with Vince stepping down and Triple H uh, being put in charge of creative No surprise, Raw's ratings ended up being up on Monday. They averaged 1.9 million viewers and swept almost every key demographic uh, on both cable and network TV. They drew a .50 between 18 and 49s. Uh, As a result of that, it was the second place show on all of television. It actually beat the shows on Telemundo. It beat Univision. The only thing it did not beat was The Bachelorette on ABC. But Killed everything else. Raw's 18 to 34 demo was the third on television behind The Bachelorette and one show on Univision. But again, another strong performance. What ended up being a little bit of a surprise, though, is a 15% drop in viewership between hours one and three, which has not really been the case as of late. And it is a little bit of a surprise just because Roman Reigns and Matt Riddle being in the main event for what it did for SmackDown When the show where Vince actually came back after all the stuff broke, that did a great number. This, not so good, but then again, it was also a three-hour show. 2.02 million viewers first hour, 1.97 million the second, and 1.71 million in the third. Got the NXT 2.0 review coming up and much more. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Wrestling Observer Live. Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Mike Sempervivi here with you. This Red Bull let me down today. They go full Greg the Hammer Valentine here. 20 minutes to warm up. And by the time we get into the action, the only thing we got really left to talk about is the NXT 2.0 overview. Hope you're happy, Brian Alvarez, wherever you're driving right now. The show opened with Zoe Stark. Now I like Zoe Stark. And Zoe Stark is, I'll put it to you like this. 
I don't think if you gave Zoe Stark over to Kevin Dunn that he would know what to do with her or that he would think much about her or that he would care much about her. Because she doesn't look like a Playboy model. She doesn't look like a fashion model. She just happens to be somebody who's incredible shape, great tan, looks good, aesthetically fine to me, and can wrestle a little bit. Her Mandy Rose. But hopefully some changes happen because, again, when you're as good as Zoe Stark, you deserve opportunities. And there's always going to be the Roxy who comes in and you just look at them and you go, my God, she's a star. She's already picked all this stuff up. You know, it's like a lot of other, like the, the MJFs and people like that who have been able to pick up things from a very early age and impress. You know, and there's always going to be your show ponies that are brought in. You know, because they look good and they may be athletic a little bit, but those people need somebody to work with. And I look at Zoe Stark and I I don't get the same feeling that I had with Becky Lynch because Lynch had had a lot more experience. I was a lot more familiar with her with, with Shimmer and all the stuff that she did before she retired and then ultimately ended up coming back. But I can see if Zoe Stark sticks around there, she's not going to probably get to that Becky Lynch type of height. But she can be, as you have your Sashas and you have your Charlottes and you have some of that, somebody who's very consistent and who always puts on good matches and is always somebody you can rely on, I think that could be Zoe Stark. Now, she's working with Cora Jade and Toxic Attraction. So basically, long story short with all this, Zoe Stark came out. She was super hyped up. She addressed the crowd, talked about her injury, and then Cora Jade appeared on the the top of the set to complain that Zoe stole her moment, as everybody does to her. And they went back and forth for about a minute before Toxic Attraction sashayed themselves out. And Mandy Rose bragged about being the fourth longest reigning NXT Women's Champion of all time. Awesome. She wanted respect on her name. Zoe challenged her for tonight. But Gigi Dolan accepted instead. Grayson Waller then cut a promo as we were going to break, called all the fans at home fat and lonely. When we got back, Tony D'Angelo was praising his family, but also reiterated to Joaquin and Cruz that loyalty is an ongoing trait as they have an eight-man coming up tonight against Diamond Mine. Still don't know what happened to Santos Escobar. We have heard no updates whatsoever. We don't know if they actually called him at the hospital. We don't know if they've reached out to him. Nothing. So... We'll, we'll still have to see, I guess, which direction that's going to go. Frankly, I'd prefer Santos Escobar being on the main roster as a way to go, but, you know, we, we may be hoping for too many moves too soon. Great, <laughs> Grayson Waller faced off against Wesley, and Waller was extra Waller. He's a guy that is going to be on the main roster. Unless he does something stupid, that guy is going to be on the main roster one day. And the match was fine for where the thing ended up going. Went through one commercial break, came to an end when Waller, he knocked Lee off the top rope. And then starts distracting the referee. Lee's pulling himself up near the fans, and there's a guy there wearing a full sweatsuit, a hood that is pulled down over his head. He's got a hat on and a black trench coat. In Florida, in July, in that building, he suddenly stands up, and he's got on boxing gloves to make it more ridiculous. He hits Lee in the back of the head. Lee drags himself back into the ring, but ends up eating Waller's stunner, takes the L. Afterward, the hooded man pulled everything off, got into the ring, and revealed himself to be Trick Williams, so that feud is continuing. Then it was time for Mackenzie Mixel, Mitchell to talk to the schism, the schism, the schism. Joe Gacy and his two dudes, the Dyad, Rip and Jagger, who have offsetting wacky contacts in their eyes. And Gacy wants to recruit Cameron Grimes because he feels like Cameron needs a father figure. I don't mind seeing Cameron Grimes and Joe Gacy wrestle this storyline. Oof, and grizzled young veterans. They were a lot more fun driving around in that golf cart, you know, looking back now than, than what this feels like. Four women were talking backstage after that. I know one of them was Ariana Grace because she was watching herself on an iPad and complaining about Indy Hartwell, who happened to just walk in. And Grace is a former beauty queen, and Indy doesn't have time for all that, so they're going to have a match later on. Apollo Crews against Zion Quinn. 
Quinn may look the part, but he is a long way from being prime time, and I think they know that as well too. Lots of communication that was obvious here, and at time thing, times things were a little bit awkward, like me trying to talk today. Uh, the match went for five minutes and forty two seconds, but it really did feel a lot longer than that, and ended with Cruz choke slamming Quinn for the win. Who you know again. The visual of this, and I don't care how strong Apollo Crews is, two inches shorter and like 40 pounds lighter, and to see him just lay out Quinn, you know, th- that was something. So I don't know exactly what the plan is here for Quinn, but he keeps talking a lot of nonsense and getting knocked down a few pegs. So we'll have to see what goes on there. Mackenzie then talked to Toxic Attraction about Zoe Stark when Saray walked up. She said she wasn't in the Battle Royal because she was in the UK. She said she also wants a title shot. But then Toxic Attraction blew her off so they can make her their way back to the ring. Before we got that match, we got a video package with Solo Sokoa cutting a promo on Von Wagner about next week's Falls Count uh, Anywhere match. The aesthetic on this, I thought, was very, very well done. We've seen a lot of promos with people out there just walking around in the dark, cutting promos. Everything about this, I thought, worked. And the fact that Solo Sokoa, I mean, he's... He, he looks like an Uso, talks like an Uso, acts like an Uso. He's got the presence of an Uso. One day that's going to pay off very well, hopefully for everybody involved. We did then get Gigi Dolan and Zoe Stark. Short match that Stark won with her modified GTS. They could have gave this match more time. JC and Mandy tried to jump Stark afterwards, but then JC got sent packing with a super kick. And then when that happened, Mandy ran away up the ramp. Stark stared him down, and as she did that, Cora J jumped up from behind with a kendo stick and wore her out until Roxanne Perez made the save. She was hitting her a few times, like, knowing that stick wasn't going to break like the skateboard did. She wanted to get some of her uh, uh, weapons heat back, and she certainly did that on the back of Zoe Stark. J.D. McDonough then arrived in the building, and he's got a ticket to be a fan, but then still entered through the employees-only door as the show went to break. When we come back... Wendy Chu is having nightmares about getting beaten up and losing to Tiffany Stratton. She has one moment of bliss as she thinks about her pillow spot during the Battle Royal, but then things get dark again as she remembers losing and hears Tiffany's voice. What does all this mean? It means Wendy woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Naturally. And she's going to get ugly, she promises, with Tiffany Stratton coming up. This is a... It is what it is, but I don't want to say Wendy Chu is growing on me, but of all the goofy, stupid things, I I, I guess I'm just beaten down enough. Tiffany Stratton, I think, is going to be a star. And as bad as some of this stuff is, I don't know. It's a lot better, I'll say this, than Alba Fire and, and, and Lash Legend, okay? That's where I'm putting my stand on, and that's where I'm marking my flag, and you're not going to be able to get me to shake from that. McDonough. They're killing this dude. They're absolutely killing him. He cuts a promo starting from the stands. He talks to a fan about choking on popcorn that gets stuck in their trachea because, you know, he he knows all about the human body. And he goes over to the ring announcer to tell us the the damage that a ring bell hammer can can do to a finger. And then he introduces himself to Alicia Taylor, but he doesn't do anything to her. But then he goes over to Wade Barrett, and he starts shaking his hand. Meanwhile, all cutting a promo very slowly and deliberately, and I'm shaking the hands with Wade, and, oh, Wade, all the calcium deposits in your hand from all that bare-knuckle boxing you're doing, it makes it easier to manipulate. And then, of course, Wade's got to sell the handshake. Then he goes over to Vic Joseph and kind of grabs him by the, the, the collarbone, and it took forever. It felt like it was in slow motion. It was terrible. But finally he gets in the ring. Braun Breaker, he calls him out, he obliges, he gets to the ring, and it's like, okay, let's see what happens here. Braun says they're going to face off an NXT heat wave, and that next week they're going to make the match official. And when he does that, McDonough headbutts him. He goes for this pull-in Saito suplex that he does, but then Braun just shoulder blocks him. That's it. The crowd kind of goes, ooh, ah. And McDonough comes up with his mouth bleeding. And he smiles because he likes it. And then the music hits. And we move on. And there was almost no heat. Maybe my ears were deceiving me. There was nothing going on there. 
And Braun Breaker is going to be a better worker working with J.D. McDonough, who we, we know is very good. This character, I don't, it, it ain't it. It ain't it. Get back in your car, go drive back over the ocean again, and hopefully figure this thing out. It's not dyad bad, but it might dyad the same type of death. I should die a death for that one. Anyway, Andre Chase, Bodie Hayward, and Thea Hale. This is where the show picked up for me. They were talking about Giovanni Vinci in the back, and they proceed to get all excited telling Andre Chase about their adventures in the parking lot last week with Vinci. And as they do, Nathan Frazier walks up and asks to be the honorary flag bearer for the team and the great tradition of, of men such as Jacko Victory and Rip Morgan and Johnny Ace and... Actually, forget about that guy. That one's persona non grata right now. So we'll, we won't speak of him, but Ben Carter, the former Ben Carter, was going to carry the flag a little bit later on for uh, Chase University. Hasn't wrestled since June 10th in Tampa, losing to Carmelo Hayes. So he's only had a four matches on TV. So we are still got a long way to go in the career of Nathan Frazier, and hopefully they're able to figure out some good matches for him. I think this... I tell you what, I'll take a feud between Nathan Frazier and uh, and Giovanni Vinci, but we get a, a that match was scheduled to come up, you know, after they're done talking in the back. But then we get a set of commercials. Then we get Vic and Wade bantering in front of the ring. Then we get a video package on the Adventures of Axiom, and then Mackenzie is backstage with Roxy who is pissed off at Cora Jade about turning on her, but is really pissed off about the fact she threw the NXT Tag Team title in the garbage can. She brings out Alundra Blaze. She tells the story about throwing the WWF Women's Championship into the trash can on Nitro so many years ago. And she announces that next week there's going to be a fatal four-way for the now vacant championship. Then it was time for Diamond Mind to all warm up backstage. Everybody's getting along. Roderick Strong's getting along with everybody. Everything's good. Then we had a Zoom meeting between Ulisa Leone and Valentina Faraz because Faraz was supposedly in Brazil. And Leone let her know that they are in the tournament for next week. Sanga walked up, said they can believe in themselves. He's a world-renowned talent evaluator, you know. So he believes they're going to win the whole thing. That leads into Caden Carter and Katana Chance telling uh, Mackenzie that they have a true friendship and they're going to win the titles. That brings Ivy Nidal and Tatum Paxley up to debate that. Electra walks in. They get into it over what's going to happen between Diamond Mine and the D'Angelo family. And that is where we will hit pause. And I'll give you the rest of the review when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Semper VV here with you. This final segment, finishing up NXT 2.0. Did I tell you all the women got to fighting and there were just hair extensions and agents everywhere to break all that stuff up? Indy Hartwell, by the way, defeated Ariana Grace. The less said about that match, the better. Uh, Von Wagner and Mr. Stone, Robert Stone, responded to Solo Sokoa's challenge, and Von Wagner overrode Stone, took a shot at Sophia Cromwell for becoming a model. And uh, it looks like, I don't know, again, if Stone's on the way out or not, but Von Wagner is speaking on his own, being on his own. You know, Kiana James's uh, character sucks. She's going to be feuding with Nikita Lyons, but it gave them an opportunity to show Nikita Lyons in several states of undress and bikinis and all that sort of stuff. So I guess yay to that. But the main event was the D'Angelo family defeating Diamond Mind and D'Angelo pinned Julius Creed after Roderick Strong accidentally hit Creed with a knee. The match was good by the end. Again, this match and the Giovanni Vinci uh, match with uh, Harlem Bravado or uh, with uh, uh, Chase. To me, they were by far the best matches on the show. Uh, at the end of the entire thing, after the D'Angelo family celebrated, Alunder Blaze was leaving when Gigi and JC rolled up on her trying to get the tag team titles, but she said no and pulled them away. You're going to have to earn it. And that's how the show went off the air. So... I think I've, uh, I don't think I've earned any money today, but I'm not going to be giving any back either, the same way that 
Tom Lawler should not be giving up any of his G1 purses. And we didn't get a whole lot of chance to talk about that, but I have a feeling we'll be getting into it more tomorrow. Hopefully Brian has a chance to see some of those matches that have taken place over the last two days. And if he doesn't, that's okay, because we got a whole dynamite to review tomorrow. If you're a member of WrestlingObserver.com and Figure 4 Weekly or Figure4Online.com, remember Brian and Dave will be back tonight for subscribers, reviewing everything that takes place. My name is Mike Sempervivi. Thank you, Producer Dom. Thank you, Producer John. And I will talk to you again after a while.